السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Sound clear. طيب. Okay, before we start, يعني I'm using a new set of headphones and uh, it's uh, I'm kind of hearing hearing myself in the. Yeah, I'm kind of hearing myself speaking. So, anyone know how to get rid of that? Or what are the settings exactly? Anyone here? Okay. So, how to get rid of that? Is it is there a way in the settings or so? I think there's a way, but I'll write it. Uh huh. No, it's the uh, other one. The USB, alhamdulillah, there's no problem with the, if it's by USB, but the, the problem comes when it's here. I'll write it. What about now? Okay, what about now? Do you, uh, do you still hear me? Okay, uh, I just unplugged the, uh, the speakers, so I still hear myself, but alhamdulillah, better than before. But is the sound clear? طيب alhamdulillah. Better than before? طيب الحمد لله and we'll start إن شاء الله. Okay. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا. من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون. يا أيها الذي يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة. وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل وكل محدثه بدعه و وكل محدثة بدعة وكل وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد. Uh, all the praises to Allah. We praise Him and seek His aid and ask His forgiveness and may the peace and blessings and exalted mention be upon His slave and messenger Muhammad, His house of kin, His companions, and all who followed them exactly until the day of judgment. So we start today, inshallah, with the intensive course, intensive revision course. Basically, this is a Insha'Allah, a revision to, insha'Allah, prepare you for the coming exam. And at the same time, as I have announced, it's a, another opportunity for those who have not attended, that they attend, alhamdulillah, and that they take benefit of يعني, this opportunity, insha'Allah. So we start, insha'Allah. And basically, how this, يعني, uh, revision is going to be is that we're just going to uh, read from the book that uh, was prepared the sort of level one book inshallah and inshallah we're going to comment on whatever is necessary inshallah so and uh, as we have gotten used to this being an inter interactive class or every class being an interactive class so inshallah if there's anything that you do not understand any uh, on top of what we have given out as a condition before in terms of question and answer here inshallah in this revision is going to be more flexible inshallah so here anything that you will not understand in what I'm going to whether it is regarding what I'm going to read or what I'm going to explain and comment so you can go ahead and 
ask on the spot, inshallah. And let, let not anything pass you by without understanding it. This is the most important point that you have to understand. Let nothing pass you by except that you have understood it. Don't say, okay, I'll look through this later and maybe I'll, you know, uh, I'll understand it later. This is the waswas of the shaitan because he doesn't want you to understand. Rather, if you don't understand anything, okay, uh, yani ask about it on the spot, inshallah. Ask about it on the same, at the same moment that we read or we comment, inshallah, so that you are left with no doubt bi al wahid al ahad. All right. So of course this is going to be ten days. It is originally, yani, scheduled to be ten days. Ten days of and, and two to three hours, yani, according to what to whatever to whatever time we have, and according to the time we need, inshallah. Okay. So this is an intensive course. This is an intensive course. Yes. I'm going to do it straight, inshallah. Two hours straight. Uh, we'll see, inshallah, if we need a break in, the, in between. But it's going to be ten hours, uh, ten days straight, inshallah, and two hours uh, at the minimum, inshallah. Taib. So we start, inshallah. Bismillah. I was going to start with an introduction of the importance of Arabic, but uh, yani. I haven't uh, prepared a fair amount of uh, statements and quotes of our scholars, so we'll just go ahead, inshallah, and start with the book. Okay. So first of all, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yes, of course, e every class, every class here is recorded, inshallah. Every class that we give on music is going to be recorded, inshallah. Okay, so here, Barakallahu feekum, nabda, here is an introduction to every science in general. So this is not just an introduction to sarf. But this is beneficial for you in, uh, before studying any science, any Islamic science. Okay? So here it says an introduction to every science in general, and but particularly Islam. So here he said, the author, Lugha and Istilah. Okay? And the author is myself, and I'm going to comment if there's a mistake. And surely there is a mistake. This is a principle. In any book besides the book of Allah, there has to be a mistake. So there has to be a mistake here and there. And if there is, and we are aware of it, inshallah, we will comment on it. And you will, inshallah, comment uh, respectively as we go on. And uh, yeah, any, uh, there might be a couple of changes here and there, all depending on whatever we are aware of, inshallah. So here he says, let it be known. Here, I'm going to handle the issue of Lugha and Istilah. Something called Lugha and something called Istilah. And we will, insha'Allah, see and try to understand, insha'Allah, what is the definition of both these terms and what is the difference between the two. So here he says, let it be known that terms in sciences have a technical meaning after moving them from their original linguistic meanings. So here, we can understand that uh, the words which are used technically here in sciences have two meanings. Have two meanings. Okay, the first one is the original meaning, as you can see here. From their original meaning, he says. Okay, and the original meaning is the linguistic one. The original usage is the linguistic one. So basically, there's a word, okay, which we use in uh, sarf, for example, okay, which we use in this field of uh, knowledge, in this science. And in every other science as well, there are terms used, words, okay, yani whether this science be al-fiqh, whether it be tawheed, whether it be aqidah, whether it be usul, whether it be the uh, seerah, biography of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whether it be history. So there are terms which scholars use in each and every science. Now those terms, barakallahu fikum, they have uh, 
uh, an original meaning uh, uh, before using them technically they have original linguistic meanings and this is what is called lugha. okay then they have meanings which were originated and innovated with the birth of this science or when this particular science was compiled into books and recognized as an independent subject and topic studied there were several terms innovated which have original linguistic meanings okay so here he says, let it be known that the terms in sciences, any term in, in any science, has a technical meaning after moving them from their original linguistic meanings. Meanings. So we put an S here. See, there's first mistake. <laughs> this has to be put in mind when studying Islamic sciences. Not just Islamic sciences, even every other sciences. But here what... Yeah, and it concerns us, uh, yeah, and he, uh, mostly here are the Islamic sciences because the whole point of studying Arabic in the first place is to why? Huh? Is to better understand or is to properly understand the quotes of the Quran and the Sunnah, okay? Or the text, the Quranic text or the prophetic text. This is your point. I mean, this is the aim and this is the goal. The goal is to properly understand because as we have mentioned many times before that the Arabic sciences are what are a condition a condition barakallahu fikum to understand properly not just understand because everyone has an understanding towards the Quranic text or the text of the hadith okay but what matters barakallahu fikum is knowing when that understanding is considered correct and when is it considered false. Well, there. So here he says, this has to be put in mind when studying Islamic sciences, there will always be two main usages, meanings, that we are going to take to every term. To every term. This is every term. Every term, every word, which has a technical meaning here, has to have a linguistic meaning which it is taken from okay so the linguistic meaning and the scientific technical meaning okay so the original please go ahead and stop me whenever you want inshallah whenever you don't understand anything that we have just uh, explained go ahead and stop me and inshallah uh, present your inquiries of course whenever we finish after each point, inshallah. After each point we finish, okay, and this issue, when we finish, inshallah, if you have any confusions, please go ahead and post them. So he says, first, number one, the original linguistic Arabic meaning of a word is called al ma'na al lughawi al ma'na al ma'na al ma'na al lughawi Okay, in reference to the usage of a word by the Arabs for a certain meaning. Yani what? Yani, for example, there's an object, okay? And this object needed a word because words are the means of com communication between people. Okay? And to each people, there is a certain language which they communicate with. Well, there. So this whatever this language be whether it be arabic or any any other language okay they have taken words okay to express whatever meaning they want to express okay so there's a certain object for example for example the sun the sun above us okay now the sun they wanted to uh, use a word to express that sun which is in the sky so they said the word for example shems shems so they have placed this word for that particular meaning 
this particular word for that particular meaning. Okay, and this is what is called the linguistic use. This is what what lugha means. Basically, lugha means uh, words which are used to express to express certain meanings. Certain words used to express certain meanings. This is what we call lugha. Wadeh. So again, the original linguistic Arabic meaning of a word is called al ma'na lughawi in reference to the usage of a word by the Arabs for a certain meaning which is called duqa. Huh, until here it's understood, everyone? Huh? Okay. Then, number two, the scientific technical meaning of, of terms, which is used exclusively amongst the scholars of a particular science, is called al-ma'na al-ma'na. Al-ma'na means the meaning. Al-ma'na means the meaning. Al-ma'na li-stilahi means the technical meaning. Al-istilahi means the technical meaning. Taken from the word istilah. Istilah. Which is defined as the agreement of a certain group of scholars on giving something a name after moving it from its original usage. Then here he give examples. And here... So it, you know, he, he put it into detail, he put this definition into detail, saying we can only understand what certain scientific terms mean, such as sarf, sarf is a technical term, nahu is another technical term, balagha is another technical term, okay? So we can only understand what certain scientific you know, terms, such as those, mean when we know the original meanings of those words. Because all of those words, sarf, nahu, balagha, all of those have original meanings, which is the linguistic meaning. Okay? So the scholars always mention the two meanings of a word. Although they want to convey the scientific technical meaning. See here, when they want to teach you this field of knowledge, uh huh. The point is to make you understand the technical meaning or the linguistic meaning. Huh? The technical meaning, right? So what matters here is you knowing the technical meaning. Okay? But why on top of that do the scholars define the meaning of a word or define the word linguistically? is to show you here, he says, in order to show the relationship between the original usage and the technical usage. Why? Because it gives you a better understanding of why this term was used for this meaning. It gives you a better understanding. So here, he says, they bring the original meaning used by the Arabs to show the connection between the two the relationship between both meanings that shall always be there. Okay? Now, this is a definite. Let, let, let's take some examples, inshallah. For example, bid'ah. Bid'ah. Okay? Now, this is a word, an Arabic word, that is used for a meaning, linguistically. In any, the Arabic language, the word bid'ah means what? It says it's lugha meaning, yani the meaning linguistically, is innovation. A bid'ah is an innovation. Okay? Yani anything which was innovated is called a bid'ah. Anything which is new, okay, anything which is new, originated, wasn't there before, okay, originated after it wasn't there before, is called a bid'ah. Anything. Okay? It means any innovation or newly invented thing in, in religion or otherwise, not specified to a certain field. Rather, any new thing that was not there before, okay, is called what? Is called in the Arabic language, bid'ah, to the Arabs, yani linguistically. Some examples of this usage in the Quran are. The saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, قُلْ مَا كُنْتُ بِدْعًا مِّنَ الرُّسُلِ Here you see that word, which is bid'ah, used here in the Qur'anic text, for its original linguistic meaning. See, he says, I'm not a new thing. مَا كُنْتُ بِدْعًا 
means I am not a new thing. So here, the interpretation of the word bid'an here is a new thing. So every new thing is called a bid'ah. Okay? And also, in the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, بَدِيعُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ which is taken from the same word. Badiyah is taken from the same root word. Because the root word is bid'ah. Wadih. And this word is taken from the same root. Badiyah. Badiyah al-samawati wal See, it means the originator of the heavens and the earth. Badiyah al-samawati wal Same, another, another example of another verse. So, here... This word, linguistically, what does it mean? It means anything new. Okay? Anything new without being specified to a certain classification or a certain... No, anything new. Whether in religion, whether in worldly, anything new is called a bid'ah. Okay? This is linguistically. Then, he said, the scientifically Islamic meaning you need the technical Islamic meaning. The scientifically Islamic meaning means the technical Islamic meaning of the term bid'ah is no different than the original meaning. Ah, and this is an important thing. This is an important uh, uh, point here. That when those terms are used technically, is it's not like they are yani uh, uh, it's not like their meaning changes to something totally different no the meaning the original meaning remains wadah barakallahu fikum is this clear wadah wadah means is this is this clear when i say wadah barakallahu fikum it means is this clear may allah bless you ayna so when we shift and change or when we transfer this word from using it linguistically to using it technically do we change the original meaning it is upon no we don't change completely but what do we do when we use it technically we only specify it we only narrow down its meaning Right? So, before or after its meaning was general and not specified to anything, by using it technically, we specified. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Ask uh, without permission, inshallah. Whatever you have. Huh? But it's not changing the meaning somehow. Yes, it's not changing the meaning. Not changing in the sense of totally giving it a different meaning no but changing in the sense of specifying it before it was unspecified because bid'ah now bid'ah for example what does it mean huh, what did we say it meant bid'ah huh. innovation okay an innovation in what was this word or was this meaning specified no we didn't specify it to anything we just said innovation anything new anything new is called bid'ah yes so, the technical usage of the word, what does it do? It simply specifies it. Meaning, a certain innovation. An innovation in something in particular. Wadah barakallahu fikum. This is basically what it is. This is basically what, we, basically what we do, or what the scholars do, when they use a word technically. Okay? whether that technical meaning is uh, in certain sciences, or whether those words are used by Allah or His Messenger for a certain Islamic meaning. So he says here, it means innovation, but only from the certain religious aspect. See? So then again, he says, the scientifically Islamic meaning of the term bid'ah is no different, or yani, better to say, it's not totally different. Okay, and yani what is meant here, what we say is, is, is no different, means it's not totally different. Okay, it's not totally different than the original meaning. It means innovation, but only from a certain religious aspect. In other words, the word bid'ah, linguistically, 
includes every new thing which is innovative. Yeah, you, you can you can um, you can uh, uh, overline it, and then see the way. Ah, let me give you the proper way of the scholars to yeah, uh, uh, write a comment on something on a, on a certain text. Okay. I'm going to give you now the professional way to do it. Okay? So this is the professional way to do it, is to take the pen. Okay? And what we're going to do here is, for example, what, what do we, we want to change? Or what do we want to comment, write a comment on? Is no different. So here we overline it with the pen. Pardon me, because I'm doing it with the mouse and, you know, how it's difficult. So you overline it. And then you write on the side of the page, on the margin. Okay? You write, for example, uh, meaning, yeah, any, meaning, etc. Meaning, not totally different. You write here in this manner. Okay? This is the professional way of writing comments on your book. Okay? Whichever book it is. This is the professional way, the way of our scholars that they, that they, that they, and they don't uh, strike through or don't, uh, yeah, I mean, for example, you know, uh, yes, don't strike through the, the piece of text. Rather, overline it, okay, and then, yes, exactly, and then write your comments, whatever comments you have, write it on the, the side, okay? Yeah, overline. Better overline. Overline is better. Huh? Now, overline it, and that means that you made a comment, a comment on it. Yes, exactly. 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 Well, there. Okay. Fine. So here, a now. In other words, where were we? Yeah. In other words. The word bid'a linguistically includes every new thing which is innovated. Every new thing, any new thing, every and any new thing which is innovated is called bid'a. Whereas the same word in Islam, yani technically, because some words, barakallahu fikum, are used in Islam for a specified meaning. Okay? In Islam, it means what? A particular kind of innovation. Which is the innovation in religion only. That bid'ah, which you hear in religious talks, yes? Which, yani when you hear this word in religious talks, right? Uh, the sheikh, what does he mean when he uses this word? He uses this word for an innovation which is what which is dispraised which is dispraised whereas the same word linguistically huh yes of course whereas the same word linguistically could mean something praiseworthy or something not could mean something praiseworthy any because being innovative is not always bad from a linguistic point of view. Yes? Okay. Uh, hold on, you can... Uh, no. Yes, yani, basic Islamic falls under, yani, it's a technical meaning. Okay? It is a technical meaning. Yani, technical meanings vary. There could be a technical meaning in Islam, a technical meaning uh, scientifically. So technical meanings vary. Yes. Okay. So for example, نقول في الاصطلاح الشرعي. يعني in the Islamic technical meaning. Right. So yes. So يعني the Islamic meaning is 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 considered a technical meaning. Mm -hmm. So here we say, whereas the same word in Islam means uh, 
a particular kind of innovation, which is the innovation in religion only. So here, ah, yani, okay. So here, there is a linguistic meaning, right? And on the other hand, on the other hand, yes, that's what I'm explaining now. So on one hand, we have what? Huh? We have the linguistic meaning, right? On the other hand, we have what? We have the technical meaning. Okay? Now, the technical meaning varies. And there is more than one technical meaning. Okay? There is a technical meaning according to Islam. Yes, it branches out. That's right. Or a technical meaning according to a certain... Yani, uh, or to a scientific. And you can say the technical meanings are of types. Could be an Islamic technical meaning or a scientific technical meaning. Wabih? Islamic referring to Islam. The meaning of the word in Islam. Uh, scientific meaning referring to science. Well, there. Clear? So we have, on one hand, we have the linguistic meaning, right? And then, on the other hand, what do we have? We have technical meanings. Those technical meanings, okay, are different. There is one technical meaning, which is an Islamic meaning, and another, which is a scientific meaning. Okay? Wadah barakallahu fiki. So this is a, this is a different, in okay. So for example, cars, cars. That's right, cars, automobiles, motors, etc., are a bid'ah. Linguistically, not Islamically. See, cars are a bid'ah, linguistically, but not Islamically. How? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Linguistically, because Linguistically, the word bid'ah means what? Huh. Bismillah. Mm. Means what? Anything new. Hmm? Anything new. Right? Is the car something new? Huh? huh? Of course it is. Take it as a principle. Everything is, is new except Allah. Everything is originated and innovated except Allah. Yani everything was not there before except one thing, which is Allah. That's all. So everything else, yani, can, yani, it is safe to say that all of you are bid'a, just as I am. All of you are bid'ah. Uh, from which aspect? From the aspect that we're something new? We weren't there before. We are created. Everything which is created is called a bid'ah. Why? Because we just said here, بَدِيعُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ نعم. قُلِي كُلُّ شَيْءٍ مُحْدَثٌ إِلَّا اللَّهِ مُحْدَث مُحْدَث That means new. Huh? طيب. Badi'u samawati wal ard, it means what? The originer, or originator of the heavens and the earth. Which means that the heavens and the earth are what? Huh? Are new. The heavens and the earth with everything in it. Angels, humans, jinn, all of us. All, every single thing. All existence, barakallahu fikum, is new, originated, except what? Except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So cars are a bid'ah linguistically. Huh? But are they a bid'ah in Islam? Yani Islamically? When we talk from an Islamic point of view? Huh? In respect to Islam? No. Why? Because the meaning of the word bid'ah in Islam is what? Hmm. Hmm. Is something new in religion. Good. 
It's a negative meaning. Something new in religion. Strictly and specifically in religion. Okay? Something new in religion. Yani a new thing which is done religiously. Like someone who comes, for example, and instead of praying Maghrib 3, he makes it even. He prays it 4. Here, this is something new in Islam. Yani in Islamic teachings. Wadeh? Wadeh barakallahu feekum. Huh? Or someone, for example, who when he sneezes, instead of just saying Alhamdulillah, huh? he says Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Okay? Now, did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teach us when we say, when we, when we sneeze, to say Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah? Huh? No. He, rather, he taught us to say only what? Only Alhamdulillah, only. Now, if we say over Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah, this, isn't this something new in religion? Huh? Yani religiously? Yes, it's something new. This is called a bid'ah religiously. Get it? This is the difference. Wadah barakallahu feekum. Okay? Okay. Then let me do a quick test, inshaAllah. Huh? Let me do a quick test. Now, if I ask you, as-salah, is it a bid'ah? Linguistically? Huh? Linguistically? Yes. Linguistically, yes. Why not? As-salah, isn't it something new? Ah, uh, is it something new? Yes, it is. Anything new, linguistically, I'm talking from, from a lim linguistic point of view. Yes, anything new is called a bid'ah. But is a salah a bid'ah Islamically? Huh? Islamically? No. Why? Because in religion it exists. The Prophet wasallam did teach us to pray. Wadih. So prayer is not a bid'ah in Huh. In Islam, but it's a bid'ah from the linguistic point of view because it's something new. Okay? Because it has been ordained when? Huh? After 10 years of the... Huh? After, te after 10 years from, from, from when our Prophet wasallam was revealed to. Wadih barakallahu feekum. Yes. Wadih? Okay. Aina. Uh, that's why when when uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, huh, he heard a man sneezing, huh, and he said, uh, and that man said, Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. So Abdullah ibn Umar said, and we also pay the salah to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. That whenever one sneezes, he says, Alhamdulillah. And he didn't say, let him say, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. See? And this is a very wise answer from Abdullah ibn Umar. Okay? Because he, you know, this is a very wise and a very gentle approach. And he's like, he's affirming the salah. He said, yes, salah is a good thing. We all send the salah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The salah which is the exalted mention. Okay, yes. So we, we all do that. Yes, this is agreed upon. This is affirmed. Alhamdulillah. That's a, a great yani, act of worship, which is sending the salah to the Prophet ﷺ. But particularly when we sneeze, he did not say that we say Alhamdulillah plus that. Rather, he said we say Alhamdulillah only. Wadah barakallahu feekum. Naam, go ahead. If it is a bid'ah, if we say Alhamdulillah after sneezing when we pray, huh? Is it a bid'ah if we say Alhamdulillah after sneezing when we pray? That's something else. That's another issue. That's a matter of dispute. Whether it is allowed to say Alhamdulillah or not, that's a matter of dispute. Now, can, now. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, uh, Brother Ricky. Go ahead, you can ask, inshallah. What about Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen? Well, it depends on the narrations. Now, write your message here. Would studying sarf as a structured science not be a religious innovation how is it different from a misbaha 
For example, I ask for the sake of clarification not to debate. Very good question. So the question of our uh, dear brother Ricky Baines is, would studying a sort of as a structured science not be a religious innovation? How is it different from a misbaha, for example? Okay. See, here <clears throat> there are things which exist but was not compiled and structured as a certain science. Like what? I'll give you an example. Like al-fiqh. Al-fiqh is a recognized, independent, Islamic science. Al-fiqh deals with what? Al-fiqh deals with understanding or knowing the rulings of the acts of a certain individual. Okay? So, this was it something in the al-fiqh which is the rulings given to our acts as Muslims. Yani, this act of yours is haram, this act of yours is wajib, this act of yours is preferred, this act of yours is impermissible, etc. This, these rulings, are they, uh, do they exist in Islam? Is it, yani, in Islam, is it part of our Islamic teachings, which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us? Hmm. What would, would be the answer to that, uh, Brother Ricky? Huh? Did that exist? Yani the rulings. All the rulings which the scholars talk about fiqh, of course they do. Yani for example, I give you, I give you an example. The salah being obligatory, does that exist in Islam? Huh? Yes, it does, because it is in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, enjoy in prayer. And it is in the sunnah where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says that he was ordered or he was yeah, ordered by Allah to convey to the people that uh, it became obligatory, obligatory upon them to pray five times in a day. So this existed in Islam. It is there. All the scholars did when they turned fiqh which is jurisprudence in a certain uh, knowledge, in a certain field of knowledge, is they have just to organize it. So it is not that they have innovated something, no, but they have just gone to the things that already exist and they just organized it. Yani, they made it as a certain, as, an, as a single topic which is studied. So they went and gathered all the rulings which are asked of in Islam, the rulings of a certain individual and uh, which, uh, which deal with only the outer acts, not the rulings of creed and belief, and they gathered it into one subject and they called it fiqh. Okay? The same thing goes to sarf. The same thing goes to sarf. Now sarf, as a topic, as a certain science, okay, it deals with words and how they uh, change forms. How those words change forms. Now, how those words change forms, or how the Arabs changed the form of one word to another. Huh. Did that exist? Or didn't it? Huh. Oh, what do you think? Hmm. Did that exist? Huh. Yani, okay, the question again. The question is the Arabs using different forms of a word or changing a certain form. Let's say, for example, huh, in the word, for example, the abada. So sometimes the Arabs say abada, sometimes they say abadat, 
Yes, good. So in a spoken form, it is there. Okay? But the only difference is it is not, it has not been compiled into a book. But they are, it, it, it is considered a second nature to them. Yani, the principles are there within them. They do not need, and they did not need at that time, to write down those principles upon which their speech is based. Why? Because they were the people of it, the people of the language. And it was a second nature to them, very easy to them. They did not need there was there was no need for it to be compiled in books or in certain uh, any single uh, topics. Why? It is only after when the Arabic language was threatened by the vast, uh, yani, uh, growing of al Islam until. A lot of non-Arabs started, started yani, uh, many non-Arabs came into religion, and this affected the Arabic language from the aspect of many non-Arabs uh, falsely saying, for example, or using some words, which caused this Arabic language to be affected somehow at that time. And this was notice, noticeable at that time. So when that happened, they, the scholars, needed to write down the principles of their own speech, which is the Arabic speech. So they went and studied their own speech, their own language, analyzed it, and wrote down or expressed the principles which they use in speech. So, here, have they innovated anything or have they simply went to what they have already and they just classified it and simplified it and put it into writing? Huh? They put it into writing. So, there's nothing new here. The only thing that's new is compiling it, writing it down. Well, they're putting it down in writing, making it a certain subject which is studied. This is the only thing that is different. Well, they're, otherwise, the principles themselves, they were existing in them. It was a second nature to them, whether it be sarf or nahu or balagha or any other uh, Islamic uh, topic or Islamic yani, science. Now the difference between this and al misbaha okay? First of all, you have to know that these sciences which we are studying now are means to knowing our religion. Yani, they are not meant directly. It's not like yani, the Quran and the Sunnah or matters of belief which are meant directly, yani, which you learn not to reach to something else, but learn it directly, because this is directly what you want to know. Okay? These sciences, which is what? Which is this sarf and nahu and all those sciences, are means of access to properly understanding what we want to understand directly. In example, the Quran, the Sunnah, etc. Okay? This is from an aspect. From another aspect, al-misbaha. Okay, what is defined in as al-bid'a in Islam, as innovation in Islam, is something which was, yani, which uh, or something which was possibly done, or which 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 had the possibility of being done. But it wasn't. Let me give you an example. Now, al misbaha Here it says, of course, it says here, 
المسبحه از بدعه اسلاميكلي واي I'll explain. المسبحة. Okay. Did or was it possible for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions to use such a means of mentioning Allah? Was it possible to them? Was such a thing as al misbaha or what resembles it, was it available for them to use? Hmm. What do you think, brother, brother Ricky? Uh. <coughs> was it there? Hmm. Yes, good. But regardless the fact, يعني, could, could, it, يعني, could it be that, uh, or was it, يعني, was this something that they could have done? Or was it, يعني, for example, I'll give you another example, like microphones. Could they use microphones, they, the Prophet وسلم, and the Sahaba? No, why? Because it, it wasn't available in the, at their time. Right? But the misbaha, which is counting the invocations with stones or beads, was it available to them? Yes, it was. Okay? So it was available to them. Now, it was available to them although they have not done it. Although they have not done it. Yani the reason was available. Yani the reason for them to do such a thing was available. But on top of that, they did not do it. So if they knew that they were able to do it, but they have not done it, what does this mean? This means that they saw that doing it is of no good because it is not something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught his prophet then his prophet had to teach his companions and as proof to that one of the companions came and saw a group of people using beads or using stones to count their invocations so he approached them and said that you are doing something which the Prophet ﷺ did not do, neither his companions. So he, he conveyed to them that this thing which you have done, the Prophet was able to do it and his companions, but although he did not do it, and whatever they did not do, then it is not preferred for us to do. Because if there was something good, surely the first thing who would who would do it is our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the companions okay now this is al misbaha now how is is this different from al uh, compiling sarf and all those sciences in in, the, in in those books now at that time did they need to do it did they need to write down the morphological uh, uh, principles or the grammatical principles or the they did uh, they did not need to do it at that time why there's no need because it was a second nature to them because they had the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam among them they go and ask him all the matters of religion and it was the time of legislation it was the time where laws and ru the rulings of Allah were leg were being legislated Okay, so there was no need whatsoever at that time that there be any writing. Although later on, the Quran needed to be written and uh, needed to be written down. Then the Sunnah needed to be written down. You get my point? So it because the reasons were weren't there before. 
there was no need to do it. But now, are the reasons there? Yes. Because it was narrated that when Ali radiallahu anhu wa fi kabarak noticed that the uh, uh, Arabic tongue started being affected by the foreigners coming into Islam, he went and ordered one of the people under him, who was called Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali, to write down the principles of Arabic speech. To write down the principles of Arabic speech. Why? Because he noticed that people are starting doing mistakes in the Arabic language. So to, to preserve this language from being corrupted, because why? Because if this language was, was, was uh, corrupted, then we would not be able to understand properly the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So that's why it was needed at that time that those uh, yani, uh, sciences which already existed to be compiled into books. But this is different than the Misbaha because the Misbaha was already there. Well, there. Yani the reason to count the invocations was there. Although they did not do it. Well, this is a difference between the two, and I hope this answers your question. Barakallahu feek. Okay, so here it says Al Misbaha is a bid'ah Islamically because it is an innovation of religion. It is an innovation in religion. And it is also a bid'ah linguistically because it is an innovation in that sense, etc. Well, there. Sunnah. There you go. Sunnah. The word Sunnah. Sunnah is an Arabic word. It has a meaning linguistically. Its luqa meaning is the way. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Sunnata man qad arsalna qablaka min rasulina wa la tajidu li sunnatina tahwila. Yani this is our sunnah, our rule or way. So the meaning of the word sunnah linguistically, yani according to the Arabic language, is the rule or the way. Now, this is the linguistic meaning, okay? Now the scientific Islamic meaning, okay, is, is still the way. See, subhanallah, you notice, what are those two words here? The way. Is this different from the way here? See, the main meaning is there. But the, this is the way and that is the way. But the only difference is, yani how does the Islamic meaning differ, or any technical meaning differ from the linguistic meaning, is that the Islamic meaning or any other technical meaning is what is specified. The way of someone in particular, who is who? Who is the Prophet wasallam, Referring specifically to his sayings, actions, approvals, life, etc. So there are two meanings in the scientific. Yeah, there are two meanings in the scientific istilah usage for the term sunnah. Okay, the scholars of jurisprudence, or to the scholars of jurisprudence, here, this is what I mean. See, different technical meanings. It could be because to a word, there could be more than one technical meaning according to how many sciences use this word. Do you, do you get this one? Sometimes the same word is used in many sciences. And because it is used in many sciences, it could have many different technical meanings. Well, they, like the word as-sunnah, it is, according to the jurists, it has a certain meaning. And according to the uh, uh, scholars uh, uh, which speak about the basic principles of jurisprudence, it has another meaning. And according to the scholars who speak about the, the narration of the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, it has a different meaning. Okay? So, to the scholars of jurisprudence, it is a preferred act in Sharia. Meaning that act which is deemed to be preferred, that's called Sunnah according to who? Barakallahu feek. Huh. According to who? According to the jurists. According to the jurists. See? While to the scholars of Aqidah, 
to the scholars of Aqidah, see now we're going to a different field of knowledge. Here we talked about jurisprudence first. So the scholars of jurisprudence, when they use such a word, they use such a word for a specific meaning. Yes, it is the way, but it is the preferred way. Yani a way which is deemed preferred. Okay? But now, when we come to another field of knowledge, and we talk about, for example, creed, aqidah, which is creed, they mean the way, yes, but they mean the way of the rightly guided people, which differs than the way of the innovators. That's why he says here, while the scholars of aqidah, or to the scholars of aqidah, this term, which is sunnah, is whatever is in opposition to al-bid'ah. Yes, uh, yes, according to the fuqaha, yes. Okay? Therefore, there could be more than... Uh, th this is a, a good principle here as well. You can, equal, you, can uh, you know, put it between brackets here. Therefore, there could be more than one scientific meaning depending on having this word used in more than one Islamic science. Is this good, Barakallahu Fikum? Anyone, everyone understand, insha'Allah? Hmm? Okay, alhamdulillah. Another example. Another example, fiqh. This word is an Arabic word. It has a meaning linguistically, then a meaning which is specified technically. Its lugha meaning, yani its meaning linguistically is understanding. So whenever you use the word fiqh, for its linguistic meaning, for its original meaning which it was upon, it would mean what? It would mean understanding. Huh. Understanding what? Huh. Huh, brothers and sisters. Understanding what, brothers and sisters? Huh. Huh. We like all, inshallah, to participate, as this is an interactive class, inshallah. Huh? And we want all of you, this is especially being a revision. We want all to participate, insha'Allah, if they can, insha'Allah. So it means understanding. Fiqh means understanding. Okay. Understanding what? Anything. Any bit of understanding is called fiqh. It's called fiqh. Anything. Understanding anything. And this meaning, this linguistic meaning is used in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ that they may get instructions, and they may understand or comprehend the religion. Yatafaqahu is taken from the same root word which is al-fiqh. And it has the same meaning. Okay? Here, a good example here, Barakallahu Fikum. It says, if you were to approach any Arab, okay, a Bedouin, right? Yeah, if you would go to an Arab, sitting in his tent in the middle of the desert and say, I want fiqh. If you say to him in Arabic, I want fiqh, fiqh, this word, he would ask you eventually, what do you want to understand? Why would he ask you that, Barakallahu Fikum? Huh? Why would he say, in reply, what do you want to understand? Because, huh? Because the word fiqh to, to him, what does it mean? Huh? The word fiqh to him. Hmm. It means understanding. Okay? Unspecifically. Generally. Yes. The minute you say fiqh to him, it means understand. So obviously he's going to say understand what? Right? So if you don't specify it to him, it will still be general. Well there. So he would ask you eventually, what do you want to understand? Right? But if you were to approach a scholar of fiqh, scholar of jurisprudence, and say, Ya Shaykh, I want fiqh. Now here the word fiqh to the scholars of jurisprudence, it also means understanding. But it means understanding something particular, which is understanding the rulings of Allah. 
other than creed. It means understanding the rulings of Allah other than creed. Yes, technically. So when you go to a certain scholar and you say, I want fiqh, he wouldn't ask you what the Bedouin asked you. You want to understand what, young man? Rather, he would say immediately, go get Zad al-Mustaqni'ah, for example. The Zad al-Mustaqni'ah is a certain book in jurisprudence. Okay? This is why, this is because fiqh has another usage among the scholars of jurisprudence. The scholars took this word from the Arabic usage and gave it its own meaning technically, which specifically refers to understanding something in particular, which is understand the understanding of the Islamic rulings which aren't related to creed. The, uh, the Islamic rulings which aren't related to creed. Wadah barakallahu feekum. Is this clear? Is this clear? Okay, another example. I gave you a lot of examples. Why? Because the more you understand the definitions and the difference between the linguistic definition and the technical one, the more you will perfect anything you study. And you will see this, inshallah, in the future. At-Tahara, another word. Okay, so bear with me, inshallah. Bear with the uh, many examples, inshallah, because this is will be ben very beneficial to you in the future. You might not see it now, and most likely you won't see it now, but in the future, you will understand, inshallah. Tahara. Tahara, this is a word. It has its own meaning linguistically, according to the Arabs. The word tahara, the word tahara is used by the Arabs to express something, a meaning, which is purification. Now, purification, is this purification specified in the meaning of this word? Is it a certain specif uh, specified purification? No. Here it says it can be both a physical or a spiritual purif purification. Yani, purification in general, whether physical or spiritual. And this particular, uh, or this uh, linguistic meaning of this word is used in the Quran. As you can see, the people of Lut said, وَمَا كَانَ جَوَابَ قَوْمِهِ إِلَّا أَنْ قَالُوا أَخْرِجُوهُمْ مِنْ قَرْيَتِكُمْ إِنَّهُمْ أُنَاسٌ يَتَطَهَّرُونَ And يَتَطَهَّرُونَ is taken from Tahara, from the word Tahara. Yani from the same root word. So the answer of his people was only that they said, Drive them out of your town. These are indeed men who want to, pure, to be pure. So يَتَطَهَّرُونَ is to be pure. And here the purification what they meant by it is to be pure from sins because they only said that only gave this answer to them because they did not want to engage in whatever they have engaged in those sinful wretched acts of approaching men sexually so they said, oh no, stay in, uh, get them out of your town. Those are men who want to be pure, or those are people who want to be pure, yani from their sins. So they use purification here not for a physical meaning, rather for, for a sp spiritual meaning. And this means that purification in the Arabic language is not specified to a physical purification. Rather, it also covers spirit the spiritual purification. So here Tahara was used for a spiritual purification, purification from homosexuality. Yes, very, very, very much, very much. In fact, as Sheikh Ibn Uthameen said, that the purity of the heart is the main purity. And any, every other purity is based upon it. In, uh, in another example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ جُنُوبًا فَاتَّهَّرُوا 
And if you were, if you are in a state of janab, yani after sexual discharge, you're in a state where you cannot pray and you cannot do certain rituals that you were able to do before. Purify yourselves. Ittaharu. Purify yourselves. Bathe your whole body. So here, the word ittaharu, which is which means purification, was used for what? For a physical purification because it covers both. In this ayah, the term tahara refers to a physical purification. So the word tahara in sharia means any kind of purification. But now here in Islam, see in Islam, in Islamic Islamic meaning, yani in the general Islamic meaning, the meaning of tahara is no different than its linguistic meaning. It's no different. No different. The general Islamic meaning, okay? But let's come and see the scholars of jurisprudence, the jurists. Huh? Just as I have explained a while ago when I said they have made al-fiqh into certain subjects, right? Which uh, deal and, 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 and research the acts of uh, every Muslim which is not related to creed, right? So here, obviously, it is obvious when the scholars of jurisprudence, the scholars of fiqh speak about tahara, speak about purification, they're only going to be speaking about the physical purification because it is the purification which is not related to creed. The purification which isn't related to creed is the, is the what? Is the physical purification okay so they said uh, or so the word yeah so here but in the science of fiqh the scholars used it to specifically refer to wudu ghusl tayammum and all of these three are physical purifications yani purification that is done in a physical way because you run the water over your body parts or the dirt as well okay see this is different see here ha uh, sister um amana here we have more than one technical meaning see we have an islamic meaning which is a technical meaning then we have a scientific meaning which is a technical meaning also so here more than one type of of a technical meaning in the above ayah, is it linguistic or it's linguistic? Okay. Then here, uh, another one. The word salaf. Salaf is lugha meaning. And this word, linguistically, it means anything that came before. Yes, linguistic. In the ayah, which ayah? This one? This one or this one? The first? Hmm? The second? Yeah, both the same. It's linguistic and it's also Islamic. Because I told you the general Islamic meaning is no different from the, from the what? Uh, the general Islamic meaning is no different from the linguistic one. Okay? It is the certain technical meaning which is different. Which is the meaning according to the scholars of fiqh. Then we have the word salaf. For example, another example. Okay? And I give this example because of the many yani, um, yani, uh, uh, lack of understanding towards this term which is used Nowadays, inshallah, now, this word salaf, its lugha meaning is anything that came before. This is what it means. By the way, yeah, the word salaf means anything that came before. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in this regards, We made them a salaf, yani we made them an example. We made them a preceding example for the people who come after. So the word salaf means anything that came before. 
Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, for example, وَلَا تَنْكِحُوا مَا نَكَحَ أَبَاؤُكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَمَقْوَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا huh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this, said this in Surah An-Nisa وَلَا تَنْكِحُوا مَا نَكَحَ أَبَاؤُكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ Okay, this is in Surah number 4, verse number 22 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says huh? And marry not women whom your fathers married except what has already passed so the word salaf here in this verse which is in surah number four verse number 22 uh, the word salaf means past and past means means came before well this is the meaning of the word salaf linguistically so linguistically the word meaning of the word salaf is whatever came before and in al-bukhari yes in al-bukhari that's right in al-bukhari the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says to his daughter Fatima, he says, Ni'ma salaf ana laki. Yani, I'm the best predecessor to you. The best predecessor to you. This is in Sahih al Bukhari. Now, but when the scholars uh, scholars used this word or use this word, they are referring to the to something particular which is past. Something particular which has come before. Yeah, not anything that came before, or rather a particular thing which has come before, which is what, which are the first three generations of Muslims, starting from the Prophet's, the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and two generations after. Yeah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his companions, then the followers, then the followers of the followers. And this is taken from, na'am, salaf na'am. Ahsant. Very good. Salafa is fi'lum madi. Very good, mashallah. Uh, so here, this, yani, the scholars took this meaning or this Islamic meaning from where they took it from this hadith, from the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, reported that a person asked Allah's Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as to who amongst the people were the best. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, of the generation to which I belong, then of the second generation, then of the third generation. So whenever you see this word, Barakallahu Feekum, used by our scholars, and you find this a lot, in the, especially in uh, Sahih Muslim, uh, in the explanation by an nawawi you find him using this word. He said, Ma alayhi salaf, what, what, what the salaf were upon. So the word as salaf to the scholars, to our scholars, when they mention it in their books, what, who are they talking about? They're talking about the first three generations of Muslims because, why? Based upon those generations, in particular being the best of all generations and the best in everything, especially in understanding the religion. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, akhil kareem. Now, now we took a lot of examples and we got to know and understand insha'Allah well what is the difference between the linguistic usage and the technical usage, okay? Now we want to know what is the, yani the meaning of this word, which means technical, istilah. Istilah means technical, okay? This word in itself, it has a linguistic meaning and a... a Technical meaning in the word istilah, which means what we have explained before, it has a linguistic meaning and a technical meaning. The linguistic meaning of the word istilah is is agreement. So any agreement is called istilah. Any agreement whatsoever is called istilah. So if you say, for example, إصطلح زيد وعمر إصطلح إفتعل إصطلح إصطلح زيد وعمر يعني زيد and عمر have agreed or زيد and عمر made up واضح? So this is the, weird, the meaning of the word إصطلح what linguistically right? It means agreement الاتفاق and ittifaq means agreement, as in people reaching to an agreement. No. Now, this very word has an, a technical meaning as well. Okay? 
And the technical meaning is what is how we say in English technical. That's the meaning of istilah technically. The meaning of istilah technically in English is the technical meaning. Which is defined as the agreement of a certain group of scholars to use a term for a meaning after moving it from its original Arabic usage as the examples that we have just taken above. Okay, until here it's clear. Until here everything is clear. Now we are going to demonstrate what we have just learned. Okay, we're going to demonstrate now why you, you will see now you will witness right now the importance of what you have just learned which is the difference between the linguistic meaning and the technical meaning and now you will get a better understanding especially those of you who have studied before the Medina books or any Arabic, Arabic books you will greatly benefit from those technical terms here that you might not ha have known uh, where it came from because I'm sure that you know mm, uh, that some brothers here uh, and uh, probably a, a lot of sisters here have uh, gone through the Medina books and the or any other Arabic books uh, or, or classes uh, speaking classes and you know you know there are some terms used barakallahu feekum such as fatha and kasra and dhamm and what you already know of such terms is that the fatha is this right and the dhamma is this correct and the kasra is this right so that's known to everybody that doesn't need but here what will help you understand okay is knowing how those terms were developed how they originated okay and this will help you a lot especially in the terms that uh, are really yani that are touching the the principles okay because the more you, the more you get a better understanding of that the more you understand you understand why and and how you have used this particular word or this particular sign in this particular place see? so he says here haraka now we're going to take basically this is the important glossary that we, that you have to take inshallah before entering into this field of knowledge haraka you heard this who who of you have not heard this word before haraka good only one huh haraka haraka so all the rest have heard of this word haraka and harakat okay good <laughs> haraka and harakat the plural of it is harakat so we have haraka and we have harakat okay now the linguistic meaning of the word haraka and its plural harakat is movement movement any movement is called a haraka hmm? any movement is called a haraka okay so here the movement of my lips now with the teaching is called haraka okay and when you type down what you're typing in the chat box this is called a haraka right barakallahu feekum Huh? And when you're typing those ones now here, this is a haraka, right? A haraka, a movement. Okay? This is the linguistic meaning. But in istilah, yani, technically, the meaning of al haraka refers to the movement of the mouth that occurs while making the vowel sounds of the three harakat. And basically, Yani, this is a complicated definition, but let me give you yani, a better one. Is the signs which express the certain sounds spoken with letters. The signs which exp or the signs 
of certain sounds spoken with letters okay so if you want something nice and simple you can write that as a definition okay there are certain signs for certain sounds spoken with letters okay C uh, signs of certain uh, certain so uh, certain signs of certain sounds which come with letters yes that's it certain signs of certain sounds which come with letters that's it a, a, a nice simple uh, definition if you want a simpler want it simpler than this so certain signs uh, of certain sounds which which come with letters well, there. okay yes uh, it says here so it says here refers to the movement of the mouth the movement of the mouth see you but why did I write this definition huh why did I write this definition to to show you that the linguistic meaning was specified to this yes to show you how it goes back to the linguistic meaning in the linguistic meaning haraka any movement right so the technical meaning specified it a certain movement not a movement of the hand not a movement of the foot not a movement of the head not a movement of the belly rather the movement of the mouth so something in particular okay that occurs while making the vowel sounds of the three harakat the name of each haraka is based on its original usage there they are as follows now fatha the word fatha fatha okay so all of us inshallah understand what harakat means huh harakat huh okay so basically a haraka uh, linguistically is any movement but um, uh, technically a movement uh, expressed by a sign a movement of the mouth sorry a movement of the mouth with a sound expressed by a sign by one of the three th th three signs that you know which is called the uh, pesh and uh, zabar and what huh? zabar pesh and what and zir yes okay okay that's in urdu by the way it has nothing to do with arabic okay طيب فتحة فتحة originally means an opening فتحة فتحة we call this tilted dash above the letter which expresses the sound a which expresses the sound a a a we call it a فتحة okay now why do we call it a فتحة there's a reason or why have the scholars called it a fatha why this particular word why this particular term out of all the words in the Arabic language and in the dictionary why have they taken this word particularly well there so this is basically what we're asking so here the answer is that they took this particular word because this word means opening 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 as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ when the help of Allah comes and the opening the opening in the sense of the conquest of Mecca it makes an a ah sound the scholars call this sign which makes that particular sound the fatha because it produce it is produced by the typical vertical opening of the mouth typical opening of the mouth yani open your mouth normally the mere opening of the mouth with that sound is a fatha huh? isn't it opening ah see 
Just release the sound and open your mouth. Ah, ah. What? So that's why they gave it this name in particular. In particular, Fatha. They called it Fatha because this sound, which is ah, is produced by the typical opening of the mouth. Simple, is it? Well, there. And the letter, which is pronounced with a fatha, they call it maftuh. They call it what? Huh? Maftuh. 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 Okay? Okay, let's take examples here. Let's do a lot of examples, inshallah. Now here, what is the first... So, the the fatha, barakallahu feekum, huh? the fatha is this... Pardon me. Is this sign over here. Let me just, you know... Let me just... Okay, uh, let me give you an example. All right. Yeah, look at this sign, Barakallah. Look at this sign over here. See? Look at this dal, huh? Look at this dal over here. Ah, mashallah, good example, Sister Asma. Good example, mashallah. Okay? Look at this letter over here. This letter over here hmm? is a dal, right? See this sign up above? This sign is what we call the fatha. Okay? Now, this fatha, how are we going to pronounce it? By the typical vertical opening of the mouth. Ah, ah. But we're not going to say ah. We're going to do it with this letter. So instead of saying ah, we're going to say tha, 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 tha. Wadih? Wadih, barakallahu feekum. Now, the letter which we do that to, which we, yani, pronounce with this particular sound. See, we didn't say the, neither did we say the. Rather, because of this sign being above, we said what? We said particularly that. That. Wadah barakallahu feekum. Khair inshallah. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. No problem. All right? So, this letter, every letter, Huh? which has over it this sign, which is the fatha, what do we call it? Huh. What do we call it? We call it maftuh. Maftuh means has a fatha. Or, in other words, was given a fatha. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan. Right? So, and again, maftuh means a letter which has a fatha or a letter which was given a fatha okay and better to say a letter which was given a fatha maftuh yani given a fatha by you wallah barakallahu feekum okay this is maftuh okay here here ida ja nasrullah wal fatih okay please let's work together huh? let's work together inshallah on this you know you see this verse here on the board Okay? Now, where is the first fatha on which letter? Here. The first fatha that you see is on which letter? Is on this letter. Very good. Which is called a dhal. Okay? Okay. How do we pronounce this letter? With this fatha? Huh? Just open your mouth vertically. Tha. Tha. Right? Okay. Now this the what do we call it? Because it has a fatha, what do we call it? Very good, mashallah. We call it maftuh. Why? Because it has a fatha. Okay? So because this letter has a fatha, what do we call it? We call it maftuh. Why maftuh? Maftuh, linguistically, what does it mean? Maftuh means was opened. Was opened. Okay, but they said maftuh uh, using the technical meaning. Yani was given that sign. 
Okay? All right. Where's the other? Where's the next fatha? The next fatha is on which? Uh, which letter? Good. The jeem. Where's the lamb? You mean this one? No, this is not a lamb. This is an alif. Okay? The jeem. The jeem. Wadih, not Jeremy. Jeem. Okay? Jeem. The jeem here has a fatha. Okay. Now, how is A, A, be careful, huh? How is A fatha pronounced? G good. Ah, ah, ah. Okay? So you're going to do that same sound but with the gene. J, J, J. So how do you do it? J, J, J. See? So when you did that, how did you do that? You opened your mouth. Simply. J. I know, I know. Barakallahu feek. J, J. Wadih, J. Wadih. Okay, the jeem here, 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 the jeem, with this particular haraka, what is, what, it is, what, what is it described as? What can we call it as a description? Maftuh, why? Because it has a fatha, it was given a fatha. Wadah barakallahu feekum. Clear? Hmm? Yeah, we, we say Naam, Jim. Naam, Maftuh, yes, Maftuh. Maftuh, yes. Wadih. Okay, where's the next one? What's the next letter? It has a Fatha. Huh? The Hamza, this Hamza. Uh, mind you, this is not a fatha. Huh? This uh, this sign here is not a fatha. A fatha is a tilted dash. Okay, this is not a fatha. This is called something else, which we will which we will sh uh, tell you later, inshallah. We'll let you in on the secret later, inshallah. Okay, so here this hamza is what gets the fatha. And how do we pronounce this? Ah. Ah. Very good. Ah. Because that's how the Hamza is pronounced. Ah. Ah. Wadeh. Okay. Where's the next one? The next letter with a fatha is the noon. Noon. So how do we pronounce this noon with the fatha? What do we say? Na. Na. Very good. So the noon here can be called what? Maftuh. <laughs> Good. Because it was given what? It was given a fatha. The next one. Next letter with a fatha. Okay. Barakallahu feekum. Can I say where is the next maftuh? Can I say that? Where is the next maftuh? Huh? Okay, what does it mean if I tell you where's the next maftuh? What does that mean? What am I saying? Good. Where's the next letter with a fatha? Good. So where's the where's the second the, the next maftuh? The lamb. Allah. La la. Good. Okay, where is the next Maftuh? Good, MashaAllah. Wow. How do I pronounce it? Wow, very good. Where is the next Maftuh? Huh. The Fa. Good. How do I pronounce it? Ah, okay, good. How many maftuhs are there in this uh, verse? Huh? How many maftuhs? Uh, seven, good, mashallah. 
7 اوكي واضح بارك الله فيكم جود اوكي alright اوكي نمبر 2 كسرة كسرة now the كسرة is simply the tilted dash under the letter okay so if the tilted sign comes over the letter then it's a fatha and if it comes under the letter then it is what it's called kasra simply the difference okay now let's get to know inshallah let's get to know about this kasra uh, this kasra and what's the story of kasra and why was it called a kasra and what's the original meaning of the word al kasra and what which meaning did it go to after having that original linguistic meaning kasra that's how to say it kasra 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 okay kasra original means a break a break what break any break a tea break huh? <laughs> yeah whether whether it's metaphorical or literal any break is called a kasra but originally literal of course so uh, the, the, the literal meaning of kasra is a single break okay so that you, I mean, if you you know broke a cookie into two that's called the kasra that break that particular action of you breaking the cookie into two halves huh that's called what kasra or a glass no nah. oh, yes or a leg but no nah, no nah. but that's, that's too violent so no nah. A kasra, a kasra is a break, a single break, a single break, yes, it's not plural, that's the single version of that word, kasra is single, huh? so a kasra, okay, means a break, now, this is linguistically, now technically the word kasra is the, the e sound, e, e, E it makes the E sound. Wave? Wave? E. The sign is called the kasra Y. So why did they call the E sound a kasra? Why specifically this word? Why particularly this word? From among all the words, <laughs> why did they take this particular word? And name and name this sign, or name this word after the uh, nam, or give this word that sign. It says here the sign is called the kasra because the sound is produced when your mouth breaks into a smile. E, because how do you say e? Just break your mouth into a smile, releasing a sound. E, e. E na wadeh e so from that aspect they said hmm the sound that uh, is done by the mouth here is done by the breaking of the mouth into a smile so so let's choose the word which which expresses a break so they went and said ah that word in Arabic is kasra. So let's take the word kasra and use it for this meaning. So we're going to call this particular uh, symbol, which makes that sound, we're going to call it a kasra. Yani, we're going to name it after the sound it makes. Wadih. Huh? Ah. Uh. So the letter, which is pronounced with a kasra, uh, no, 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 this is a kasra. Now, the letter, which is pronounced with a fatha, what did we call it? Maftuh. Okay? Now, the letter which we will pronounce with a kasra is called maksur. Maksur. As you can see, it is said in the same way maftuh is said. Maftuh maksur. Huh? The sound or the movement? No, I'm the sound. Yeah, the sound caused by that movement. Well, there. 
اوكي طيب سو مكسور 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 means given a كسره A letter which has just as مفتوح means a letter which was given a فتحة. Same thing here. مكسور means a letter which was given a كسرة. Simple as that. واضح. So here, if I go back to this verse again and ask you, where is the first مكسور or what is the first مكسور which you see? The همزة إي. See here, here. This is the first مكسور. Meaning the first letter which has a kasra. E. 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 Wadah barakallahu feekum. Huh? E. Wadah? Kulu E. E means yes as well, as well by the way. Tayyip. E. So E. Hmm? Qala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kul E wa rabbi. Innahu la haqq. Wa ma antum bimu'jizin. Ala kulli hal. So E. Here the hamza is spoken with this sound because of the symbol which is placed under it which is placed under it واضح? okay where's the next maksur barakallahu feekum huh. the next maksur where is it the ha right here see so the ha is the next maksur okay how do we pronounce this ha with with the symbol with the symbol with the sign he he, that's why we say إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ He, he, نَصْرُ اللَّهِ واضح بارك الله فيكم So this is maksur. Any questions around maksur and kasr and all that? Huh? Excused. Now, any questions? طيب Let's go to the next one. Okay. The next one is what? The next one is what is called ضم 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 that's how to say it با I know it's difficult at first don't worry you'll get the hang of it inshallah با 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 okay با although a difficult letter to learn in Arabic but it's very it's uh, it's it's it should be easily pronounced and gently gently and easily pronounced it's easy it's not yes it's difficult to learn it at first since you never spoke it before but it is said in an, a very easy manner unlike what is commonly known that the bad is hardly pronounced no it's not hardly pronounced it's hardly learned but it's not hardly pronounced okay ba, 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 ba. very easy but it just needs you know you need to get the hang of it that's all so, ba, dam, 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 that's how to say it. Dam is basically a hug. A hug is called a dam. Huh? A hug is called a dam. That's right. Now, yani, uh, uh, holding on to something close to you, this is dam. Okay? Naam. Dam. That's what it means, dhamma. A gathering together, a joining together. It's called dhamma. Okay? So if you say, for example, or a squeeze, okay? A squeeze or a hug. That, naam. If you say, for example, dhamamtuhu uh, dhammatan, or dhamamtu waladi, dhammatan, yani I hugged him. Okay? Of course, there's also ihtabantuhu. That means I, you know, hugged him as well but dhamantu dhamma is I squeezed him or I hugged him okay anyways it means a gathering or a joining together okay simple as that okay a gathering or joining together now this word dhamm expresses a sign which represent the oo sound oo Ooh. Well, there. Which represents the oo sound. Ooh. Ooh. Now, why have they given the oo sound this name? For what? Why in why? Yani why this in particular? 
this word in particular out of all words because the oo sound when you do oo when you say oo 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 what happens to your mouth isn't it joined together huh puckered up isn't it puckered up together huh when you blow huh no so they said when that sound is pronounced huh when that sound is pronounced the uh, uh, mouth makes it while being joined together or the uh, while yeah, the, the, the lips being puckered up and joined together so we can give it the name of a a join a joining so they said oh yes bum that's what it that's what a joining means so they said okay we'll call it a dhamma then every single a sign which makes that sound, we'll call it a dhamma. A dhamma. Well, there, we'll call it a dhamma. So it is called as such because the sound it, produ it is produced when you pucker your lips together in an O shape. The letter, n n n. Now, just as the letter which is given a fatha is called what? Huh. Huh. It's, it's called maftuh. And the letter which is given a kasra is called what? Maksur. Same thing. The letter which is given a dhamma is called madmoon. 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 Madmoon means given a dhamma. Same thing like we said before. Give it a fatha, give it a kasra, give it a dhamma. Same thing. Give it a dhamma. So every letter which was given a dhamma is called what? Madmoom. Madmoom. Wadi? Naam. True. This is one of the uh, difficult uh, is when you join certain letters together, pronounce them together. Now, Okay. Where Where is the first madmoom here in this verse? Huh. In this verse. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ ضراء. As you can see, this Ra has that sign over it. Ra, Ra, that's the name of this letter. But, however, when this sign is with this Ra, we, don't, we, we no longer say Ra. We say what? We say Ru. 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 We say Ru. Not Ru, but Ru. Ru. Ru, just one O. Ru. Wa there? Okay. Where is the next madmoon? The next madmoon. Where is it? The ha. Ha. Not ha. Rather, ha 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 ha. Ah, ha. Ha. Okay. Ha. But here, since this sign is over this letter, which is the ha, we're not, we're no longer going to say ha. We're going to say hu, 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 hu. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to do it with that sound, with this, with the o sound, hu. Right? Then he said, it is a basic principle that when we stop on a word, we silence the last letter. Of that word. Ah, this is an important principle, right? So, for example, here, here the ha. What does it have? Huh? It has a dhamma. And because it has a dhamma, what what can we call it? Huh? Good. We call it what? Madmoon. Okay. But here, barakallahu fikum, you are speaking. Okay. Now, if you end with a letter which has one of those three signs, if you end your speech on a letter which has one of those three, sign, three signs, in other words, if you end your speech with a maftur or a maksur or a madmoom, don't pronounce that sound rather 
silence the letter. Rather, silence the letter. Notice how I read this verse. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Notice how I read the verse. Notice how I stop on the who. The who. Huh? What is what called? The stopping? al -wukuf. al -wukuf. The stopping is al -wukuf. So, notice how I read this verse. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Did I say وَالْفَتْحُ? وَالْفَتْحُ? No! What happened there? I silenced it. Instead of me saying الْفَتْحُ, what did I say? إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ 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 Silenced it. This is a general principle. Whenever you stop, whenever you end with a word, you don't pronounce the the sounds that come with it. Rather, you silenced it. Silenced. Unless you're continuing. Like, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحُ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ If you continue reading, then you pronounce the sound that comes with it. Okay? This is a principle to the Arabs. The Arabs never move what they end with Neither do they silence what they start with. They don't move. Yani they don't give a sound to what they end with. Neither do they silence what they start with. Yes, a principle. al Arabu لا تقف على لا تبتدي بساكن كما أنها لا تقف على متحرك. Yes. So the Arabs, they don't give a sound to what they end with, but and they don't silence what they start with. Wadah barakallahu feekum. Clear? Clear? Yes. All right? Yes. Okay. So here he says, uh, it is a basic principle that when we stop on a word, we silence the last letter of that word. An example, yes, of course. It, it, take it as a principle. Whoever wants to ask, let him ask immediately, inshallah, without, without permission, no problem. So, in example, do not read the vowel on the last letter, as we have just demonstrated for you. Now, I think we're going to end soon, inshallah, because it's been two hours now, inshallah. So, we're going to end soon, inshallah. So when a harakah comes on the last letter of a word, yeah, the classes, the other classes are on schedule. Okay, the only thing we did is we just added. Okay, we added some classes. That's all. The al Arab la tabtadi'u bisakin kama anha la taqifu ala mutaharik. Na. Wadeh. Ten days now. Now, طيب. so when a harakah comes on the last letter of a word and we are stopping on that word, then we do not pronounce the harakah. In addition, in addition here, there's another principle here. And, and another principle here. In addition, when we stop on a on a on a on a, on a closed tab, any some letters have you know some extra pointers to, to, to st when, when stopping, when ending with it. Like the ta. See, uh, can, can the brothers and sisters here pronounce this word? Huh? Here? Of course there is the phonetics here, but try to pronounce it without looking at it. Barbatun. Huh? See? Barbatun. Barbatun. 
ضربة تن ضربة تن okay now here بارك الله فيكم when you end with this particular letter which is the ta here this is a closed ta as you can see it's not opened okay it's not opened it is not yes it's not opened but rather it's closed it's tied okay uh -huh. yes yes with the two dots that's right we pronounce the ta as a ha if we stop at it just as a ha yani instead of what i've just said darbatun tun we say darbah darbah bah and we turn it into a ha yes we don't say darbat good we don't say darbat we say darbah yes from the throat naam ahsanti ya zayb wadih darbah darbah okay ha huh, enough for today Enough for we continue. Huh? Let's see. The concepts? Okay, we'll finish the concepts, inshallah. Okay, good. We'll finish the concepts. Okay. Okay, just the concepts, inshallah, and just the speech. Okay. Sarf. Now we've reached yani, the point from all of this is to know Sarf. Sarf. Now this is the name of the very science that you are learning now. Okay. So Sarf. What does it mean? Sarf. Sarf. It's Lugha. Meaning, meaning is linguistic meaning circles around two general meanings. Sarf, this word, sarf, which is cha changing and turning. Tafadhali ya athfar, tafadhali wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, changing and turning. Changing and turning. Simple as that. Some examples from the Quran are قال الله تعالى وَإِذَا مَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ Yes, changing and turning. وَإِذَا مَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ نَظَرَ بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَى بَعْضٍ هَلْ يَرَاكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ ثُمَّنْ صَرَفُ صَرَفَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ As you can see, صَرَفَ Three word, three letters. The three root letters here. صَرَفَ and in صَرَفُ when we read the interpretation, what do, what does it say? It says, and whenever there comes down a surah, a chapter from the Quran, they look at one another saying, does anyone see you? Then they turn away. So the word in sarafu means turn away. As I have explained here, turning, see, turning, in sarafu. Sarafu means turn away. Allah has turned their hearts away. Sarafa. Sarafa means Allah has turned. So yes, again, the meaning turn, okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Yusuf alayhi salam, قَالَ رَبِّ السِّجِنُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا يَدْعُونَنِي إِلَيْهِ وَإِلَّا تَصْرِفْ تَصْرِفْ Unless you turn away. And here it says, صَرَفَ عَنْهُ كَيْدَهُنْ يعني, he turned away from him their plot. Yes, yes, a five letter. In Sarafa, Babel uh, Infial. Babel Infial. It is Mutawa. The Mutawa of Sarafa. The Mutawa of Sarafa. It is a Mutawa to Sarafa. Sarafa, Sarafa, who fan Sarafa. No. 
yeah, here, yeah, that is for the level two students now. No, no. Okay. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَتَصْرِيفِ الْرِيَحِ The veering of winds. And the veering of winds is them being turned from one place to another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أُنظُرْ كَيْفَ نُصَرِّفُ الْآيَاتِ See how variously we explain the ayat. Yani, turn them from side to side. Okay? Now. No, this turn aside, this is just the fool. This is another one. But here, نُصَرِّفُ الْآيَاتِ يعني We show them the proofs. We show them from this side, from that side. What? Now. So, now. The istilah meaning of asar. The istilah meaning, and the technical meaning of asar, is a certain kind of changing. It is a changing of something particular for the sake of something particular. Uh, so, you know, to understand better this word technically, just circulate your mind, okay, around those two descriptions. The changing of something particular is number one. And this changing is for the sake of a particular thing. This is number two. So, what particular thing are we changing? And for what particular purpose are we changing? This is the definition right here. It says, changing the source. Meaning the root word. The, the, the root word, which is the uh, verbal noun. To different forms in order to express different meanings that aren't expressed except through their certain forms. And an easy way to remember this definition is to first ask yourself, what is the reality of it? Yani of sarf. So you answer, it is the changing of the source to different forms. Then you ask yourself, what is the reason to this changing? Then you answer, to express different meanings. Wadeh? So, what is the reality of it? It is the changing of the source to different forms. And we'll explain, inshallah, in the next class, what is tomorrow, what is the, the meaning of, what, did, what do we mean when we say the source? What is the reason to it? It is to express different meanings which aren't expressed except through their certain forms. And this, inshallah, will be put into detail, inshallah. Let me see. In the coming, yani, uh, pages. Be put into detail in the coming pages, inshallah. Okay? Yes, every day for 10 days until the exam. No, no time for questions, inshallah, because this is just a revision. Wallahu ta'ala alam, wa sallallahu wa sallam, wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Yes, everyday revision. Now. And plus the Arabic uh, classes, which will be after Isha. So they're going to be extra classes. Assalamu alaikum.